afternoon to all. I, I have the pleasure to present to you a very good friend uh, and a person that we uh, have admired for a long time and have uh, used his work as a reference in many of the works that we have developed here. It's Jelle Feringa. We have been meeting in several conferences around the world, but we have never had him. Well, we had him for, for a conference, or was it for a desk read? Like five, five years back? Okay, for the Open Thesis Fabrication Program it was. Okay, good. So, um, I guess you all might know, but uh, Zele Feringa is an expert in robotic fabrication. He's an architect, uh, a practitioner of architecture. He's leading the EZ uh, City Architectural Office, but he's uh, also uh, running his own robot workshop, uh, the little robotic arm babies that we also uh, try to, in a way, make them work for us and try to take the advantages of uh, this kind of digital manufacturing and how it would help us change the way that we produce, therefore also the way that we design. And uh, I think that based on the fact that the architects, um, it's not only the design that we are interested to develop, but also the new tools uh, for production. This is also what Jele is very much interested to it. That's why he has his own workshop, and, and that's how you manage to, in a way, create your startup, which is the Otico, and experiments the materialization of the architectural design. It's a kind of a new discipline as well that is uh, appearing in, uh, in architecture that is this kind of in-between architects and constructors that has to do with uh, the experimentation of the digital manufacturing techniques and this is very fundamental and related with the change of paradigm that the technologies are bringing to the architectural field. So I think that all the work that you will be showing today is related with that as well. And uh, just to conclude that Zele is, um, has been uh, uh, publishing his work and exhibiting his work in different parts of the world. We saw his work in the Archie Lab uh, in Orleans like um, two years back, and then as well in Pobidou and in New York and many other places. So nothing more than welcoming you, thanking you for being here, and looking forward to see your last work. Thank you, Jelle. Thanks. Hi. Thank, what am I doing? Thank you all for uh, for joining me in this uh, in this lecture, and thanks for uh, for a kind kind welcome. Um, so today, I would like to reflect on our work and on how the architectural profession is evolving. Um, so I'll start with a number of slides introducing the, the work I've been uh, uh, evolving over the past 10, uh, 15 years almost. And then I'll focus on more recent projects where, uh, where I've been shifting my practice more towards uh, manufacturing for the, for the last five, five years or so. so um, you'll see this split in the in the presentation, um, but what I would like you to 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 try is to think how does this ap apply to your to yourself as young aspiring ambitious architects? How how do you see that the profession will evolve? And, and perhaps in this in this presentation there are some some evocative ideas. Of, uh, of how you will work uh, the next coming 40 or 50 years or so. So perhaps some of you um, have, have come across this, this project. It's, also, it's already a project of about uh, 10, 11 years old, where we've utilized uh, evolutionary computing genetic uh, algorithms to, to come up with difference with a meaningful difference, right? It's trivial to, to parametrize a chair, uh, you know, changing its height, the depth of its seat, but can you, 
is it also we were asking ourselves is it possible to create instances of the same design concepts and that also already evokes the idea that you know industrially it's not such a problem to to create hundreds thousands tens of thousands of new chairs but how do you do so in an in an intellectually meaningful way if you w want to to explore that that concept seriously that means that you need to be able to instantiate a design concept rather than to trivially change some design parameters um, so the interesting thing about this project was that we finally using the, the grid computing uh, facilities at the, at the INRIA uh, we came up we generated about a, a series of 25 chairs and what was fascinating about this process is that there was no post processing in a sense right from the design the manufacturing code to cut all the, the wooden panels to, to build these chairs it was an intrinsic part of the of the project so that was one of the first projects where let's say design and manufacturing um, there, there was not this hard split between these two different domains and that has been a theme that I've that I've delved in uh, further and further a recent project by the uh, by the office is utilization of uh, uh, 3d printed molds to to create these ultra high performance concrete concrete structures um, something to emphasize is that the the, uh, the the concrete we're familiar with is not at all the same material than the ultra high performance concrete that are uh, are being uh, that are that are available on the market now actually is that uh, as we all know concrete has little compression strength you have to imagine that the, the most advanced new concrete mixes have as much tensile strength that more more uh, more traditional mixes have in compression strength that is that is how huge the, the difference is so these uh, these new concrete mixes they can deal with up ten times more compression strength than, than what we're familiar with, right? So that that also triggers the questions that what kind of structures are those that effectively um, utilize these newfound properties? Finally, another project is that of the Sarusi Pavilion. Uh, Madame Sarusi is a well-known art collector living in the in the periphery of, uh, of Paris in Meudon. She lives at the estate of André Bloch, who is uh, uh, perhaps familiar with you as the founder of Architecture d'aujourd'hui. Um, so in this estate, there is a number of these beautiful habitacles by Bloch, which are, which are you can think of sculptures for living with, not, not in. Um, so in that project, I've applied this idea of evolutionary uh, computing to the, to the super corny idea of designing with light. So evolutionary computing in a sense it allows you to, to kick in open doors with a, um, because it allows you to rethink this idea of this really corny I idea of designing with light with such, such uh, uh, an absolute precision such a detail that you are not uh, humanly capable of yourself that it, uh, it, le it legitimizes in a sense to, to revisit these really fundamental ideas and this competition meant, meant some form of a, of a pivotal point for me in, uh, we, we won this competition I think in 2007 or 2008 and it was kind of exciting because offices like those of Hernan Diaz Alonso Georges Legendre, Dramatio Keuler, Peter Macapia, and I think later on also Francois Roche were involved in this project. So we won, and we thought, like, fine, we were going to build something. But in architecture, going from winning, <laughs> winning a design project doesn't mean necessarily that you will that you will build it. And even though from the from the 
start of the project we really engage some of the top engineers such you know that you don't design something that something that is a fallacy and that cannot cannot be built so not being able to realize that was yeah, was something of a of a tough break later on i tried to to sublimate sublimate some of the uh, ideas of the competition the idea that i was trying to achieve with with um, the evolutionary computing was to to form find a gallery such that throughout the whole day throughout the whole year always the gallery is lit by 300 uh, loops of light and after after not being able to to build with this e expertise of, of celestial mechanics what i've tried to come up with is a is a sculpture that kind of a, a achieves the essence of that idea that sublimates that idea is that even though the earth is moving with about 30,000 kilometers per second this circular shadow stays in place um, a, a circular shadow even though that we are moving through the universe in, in this incredible perpetual motion um, so that perhaps this approach of evolutionary computing can be well summarized by, by this beautiful sentence uh, of Solovit. Conceptual artists are mysticists rather than rationalists. They lead to conclusions that logic cannot reach. And I think that was the, the, the interest of working with evolutionary computing, that it's kind of an amplifier for your ideas, right? Cranking it up to, to 11. And that, that relates to an idea of uh, Theo van Duisburg, one of the founders of the style, uh, where he suggested that, that he was interested in the mere consequence of, his, of a simple idea. And so this, this a, a, few, a few months ago, around um, in, at Facebook, the, the following image popped up. I, I have a little bit of a difficulty with this idea of architectural competitions. Um, so this was a, a shot of uh, a friend, a dear friend of mine, a very talented uh, Gio Redson, who was submitting his design proposal for the Guggenheim uh, Helsinki edition, only to find out that the postal office was stacked <laughs> with many of other uh, entries. And it turned out uh, that a total of 1,750 submissions were, were received from 77, 77 countries, which is the largest number of entries recorded for, for a competition of, th of that kind. And also in the comments you see a comment of the, of the gifted Alvin Juan. So the, U the girl at UPS asked me why everybody is sending who is based in LA, by the way, uh, just for your point of view, why everybody is sending stuff to Helsinki and, and why all those persons are so stressed out. I asked her why she was asking and then she pointed to a pile of packages on her left. Then in the comments, I don't know, are you familiar with the, 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 the talented Je Jenny Wu who's been doing amazing work in, uh, in ceramics printing? She took another angle, which is also kind of cool, I think, she says, that's why I sent it to a printer, I think she refers to a 3D printing office, in Helsinki, since she was too nervous about shipping the whole ordeal. <laughs> Good planning. But I don't know. I mean, what you see here is that some of the, the, the most talented and, and, and gifted persons in our industry are kind of throwing themselves as lemmings on these competitions. And you know, if we do this kind of work, if we do, um, because in a sense for, for the Guggenheim, you don't send in your, your lousiest work, right? You send in the top entry because you have respect for the work you do. Is that if you do that for, f we do that for free. It's, I think the, the economy in, a, in, this kind of economy in architecture is perhaps, perhaps problematic. So I was reminded also of the fact that there are other mode of operandi uh, at the time of the of the Cerussi competitions. So about 200 meters away from this competition site uh, in my 
Meudon, there were these gorgeous houses that were built by uh, Jean Prouvé, um, an, an, an ar a French architect who developed a method of construction and use utilizing sheet, sheet metal. So these, these houses were in fact prefabricated at Prouvé's uh, factory. So being in such close proximity to, to construction perhaps could provide a gateway to, to bypass, which is perhaps a damaging uh, dynamic of these architectural competitions. At least you can say that it suggests a mode of operandi where architecture is not so much a service, but, but creating a product. And I think that's a way of working that I'm, that I'm very tempted with. So I've been, I've been living in Paris for about, about five years, from 2004 to 2009, and I was living quite close um, to this building, um, one of the first creations of Prouvé, the, the Maison de Peuple in, uh, in Clichy. Later on I, I moved to, uh, to Rotterdam, and you see that the cladding of, uh, of the, the, the academic hospital in uh, Rotterdam was completely constructed by, uh, by Prouvé. So I became, I became, in a sense, forced to, to, to think about this model. And I find this, this photo really, really inspiring. I mean, here you see, see Prouvé sitting in, his, uh, in the, the house that he built at the end of, career, of his uh, career for himself with leftovers materials from, uh, from his factory, uh, factory that he was uh, unfortunately forced to, to sell. But the chair that he's sitting in, the panels of the house, the table in front of him, everything you see in this picture was built, designed and built by Prouvé himself, right? Here you see a man of an almost absolute autonomy. It's fascinating, right? And can you contrast that to our kind of dependency on the, on on advancing our field on, on competitions. Well, there's there's alternatives, right? And I think we live in a time where these alternatives could be reconsidered. So on the right, you see uh, an American architect, Bill Messi. And I think Messi is one of the proponents of revisiting this, this model of, of architecture as a product. Um, this is the Big Belt House, designed and built by uh, Bill Messi in, uh, in 2000. Um, I think his work is not that well known, unfortunately, in, uh, in Europe. I think this is the house he is currently living in, also the, the house that he, that, he built in, that he built himself, where again you see this strong quality of autonomy uh, again. And so he's an architect with a factory, right? And just take a look at the at this incredibly beautiful sink. I think it's I think it's amazing the kind of work that he's doing. So in in architecture, traditionally we know two kinds of models, right? So on the left of the image you you have Alberti, um, who was an architect that tried to abstract architecture from construction, who made considerable efforts to move away from the construction side, while on the other, on the other side we see Brunelleschi, who spent 20 years of his career building the, the, the Duomo. And there is this kind of intrinsic tension between, between the models of, of Operandi. An architect is not a, not a builder. But are we are we design designers being completely isolated of the of the problem of building? Right? There's this there's this friction. There's these two uh, op opposing models that need to be synthesized, if you ask me. Something that I find very interesting um, in the work of, of, of Brunelleschi is that in order for him to, to build the Duomo, he needed to, to, to tackle some massive engineering problems. And one of the inventions that he, that he made was this, uh, 
he created this oxen-driven hoist, um, where in a sense he he employed some kind of gear mechanism such that you that you can lift uh, a freight of a much greater weight up to the the peak of the Duomo, right? Because you can imagine the, just the sheer volume of stone that needed to be lifted. So. Nowadays, the problem of building, the problem of construction, and the design of architecture, I think, are too, too loosely coupled, right? While, while traditionally, these, there was no false schism between these fields. And it's quite possibly possible that the, the, the generation of architects bef before us have you know, have driven a kind of a wedge between these fields where where you have these amazingly competent engineering offices taking perhaps away some of the authority uh, of the architect, right? Is that if you deal with more subjective aspects of design, you know, what form the color uh, the building has, what what form, but if you if you abstract yourself uh, from how it's rea realized, uh, from structural aspects, the more objective side of architecture, then perhaps you also marginalize the profession. It could be the it could be the case. Um, I think a, a, a wonderful example, uh, almost an icon of this. This idea is this uh, um, is the Badalano that that uh, Bruno Lisci created. So, for him to build to realize the Duomo, there is the problem of hauling these massive blocks of marble from the the mountains of Carrara to to Florence, and you can imagine that not not only the intrinsic material itself is costly, but shipping it. Is a is a is a huge hugely valuable uh, problem in it in itself. So in order to to overcome these problems, Brunelleschi designed this this uh, wind driven boat to ship the material over 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 the river to to Florence. And it also is kind of an icon of of this essential problem in uh, in in architecture because ho however brilliant the idea was. Uh, and actually, it was—it's been argued to be the first patent, actually, uh, <laughs> ever to be to be given out. Um, Brunelleschi fa uh, made the designs for this boat in uh, 1420 and started shipping, experimenting with it in uh, in 1427. After he was he was uh, the town's ruling council, the Sign Signoria granted him a, a, a sweeping exclusive exclusivity of this new device. But it, it didn't work out that well for him that on the first test drive of this uh, of this boat, you know, it sunk in this wild river and uh, the marble couldn't be uh, recuperated. It was a it was a bit of a drama. So there's there's this huge tension what can be done. So what I think is very interesting is that in the in the in the nineties, I think Bernard Kosh made considerable contributions to to synthesizing these opposing m modus operandi of of architects. Right, Alberti, the the the, the architect is intellectual, uh, where Brunelleschi is the, the the more the more practical architect, being so present. So highly present, so manifest on the construction side. Um, are you are you guys familiar with the work of of Deleuze, of uh, sorry of uh, of Bernard Cash? Not at all. So he started to explore this idea of of being an architect, revisiting this idea of being an architect with a factory in the in the nineties, creating um, creating these kind of panels in custom software um, by custom software developments in, uh, in 
top solid. So, for instance, if you if you look, you know, at the uh, at the back of, of this uh, of this studio, you see this kind of panel milling experiments, right? So that's really the the the, the kind of the work that Bernard Cash was experimenting with in the uh, in the mid 90s, right? Already at an industrial scale. Um, what's interesting is that. Cash was also a student of, uh, of the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze, and, and Gilles Deleuze was also heavily inspired by, by some of the writings of, of, um, of Bernard Cash. So I feel he was an, was an architect that sat exactly at this tension of being an intellectual, but also being somebody to industrialize his intellect. And Incredibly powerful, powerful architect. Um, so to to sum up, there's this fanta fantastic, fantastic book by uh, by Frank Lloyd Wright, which he wrote himself. I mean, it's it's a pioneering work in the in the idea of self mystification, which is somebody something as an architect you need to be you, you need to be good in. And there's this wonderful quote. If I were to realize new buildings, I should have to have new technique. I should have to so design buildings that they would not only be appropriate to the materials, but to design them so the machine that would have to make them could make them surpassingly well. Right? So this we have to do away with this false schism of design and manufacturing. It, manufacturing is a continuation of questions of design. And I, I think that beautifully uh, underscores that. So around 2009, I moved from, uh, from Paris to, to Rotterdam to start working on my, my PhD uh, research. And one of the first projects I started to work on was the, the, the realization of, of a design um, of a research lab of the of the of the hyperbody. We tried to build one tenth of the uh, of the of the pavilion, and to realize that that mock-up, that prototype, I started to to work on a, a then pretty new uh, fa fabrication method, the the hot wire cutting. And my interest in in hot wire cutting is that. Traditional milling techniques are, are just too slow and don't scale up to, to architectural proportions, right? So with a wire, you're cutting through the whole length of a block rather than, you know, it compares as to a point versus a line, right? Where a milling bit essentially removes a point with a, with a certain radius from the material, while with a wire, you cut through the whole volume. So, you know, wire cutting can be uh, somewhere between 10 to 100 times faster than existing uh, techniques. Um, that research was also motivated from a more architectural point of view, where I wanted to move away from surfaceic techniques and moving towards working with you know the lightest and least expensive of volumetric materials uh, EPS foam that's also because I'm I'm well to say it really condensed I'm not a not a fan of flat pack architecture is that for, for instance I think this this metropole parasol by, by Jurgen Meyer it's it looks already dated right it looks like a hello world of learning laser cutting and a grasshopper or something, right? And that is painful, I find. Also, the project went heavily over budget while it looks so simple, right? So it tries to, to, to mimic this ethereal volume, not so successfully. And this is, this is, um, this is the work of I mean, fantastic project by 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 uh, 
Michael Hansmeier of these subdivided, subdivided columns, where you have this amazing geometric detail and intricacy. But the problem is that, you know, columns are not, bearing columns are not made out of 20,000 sheets uh, of uh, one millimeter carton cardboards. So there has been this kind of spiraling, uh, sp spiraling of quasi complexity or in manufacturing, right? My project uses a, a hundred unique el elements, and my my project is a, is built out of ten thousand unique elements. And then you know, is that clever to do? Is it you know? I don't know. So I'm more interested in, I guess, a more historical approach of of stereotomy of where where architecture in a sense def defined the drawings for the craftsmen to to for the masons to, to of the, the material to remove from the stone so arguably you can make the argument that uh, that stereotomy was the g-code of the uh, of the 1700s right at least the trans the design intent was directly translated to to manufacturing drawings, you, you could say. Um, well, so we in the, in the beginning we worked with this bespoke machine that was really engineered to this to this hot wire cutting, which was which was a very very limited approach because basically you you can use one tool one process for one specific machine and. This machine-specific, um, these sp specific machines. Well, I don't think they're they're the right way to to work. So around that time, the Opel factory in uh, Antwerp uh, had gone bust. So I knocked the door, checked out if I could buy buy a few few robots. Well, more than a few. Uh, it turns it turns out. But you know when you when you visit such a massive factory being dismantled, it makes you realize also something, and that the realization that I, that I had is that it's becoming so incredibly evident that the problem of building is no longer a mechanical problem, right? Brunelici had a mechanical problem, lifting these big slabs of, of, of this big volume of stone upward of the of the Duomo. That's an essentially mechanical problem. That is solved, right? And the reason why I think we architects need to to delve deep into manufacturing is that it's becoming it's trans it's transforming into an intellectual problem. The mechanical machinery is available, it's dirt cheap, what do you do with them? How do you program with them? It's never been so easy to to make this link between the geometry that you uh, the designs that you create and, and realizing them. Right? It's it's not it's not a question of sheer muscle power uh, that the masons had to perform cutting away these large volumes of rock. You know that is handled by a mechanical device. So the problem of manufacturing is is coming within our realm uh, again, I think. So I, I ended up acquiring a number of, uh, of of robots and shipping those to uh, to to my workshop in the, in the docks of, of of Rotterdam, and I started to experiment with these newfound uh, manufacturing methods with my students from the from the hyperbody. So this is a project um, that I've worked on where I invited Sylvan, uh, Sylvan Ursula and, uh, and Matthias Riebman, who both are founding partners of, uh, of Rock Architects, which is an absolutely amazing uh, uh, new architecture office based in, uh, in Zurich. Matthias is currently developing his PhD at the uh, Philips Blocks Research Group at the, at the ETH. And in this, for this project, we utilized this Rhino Vault software, which is a form-finding software um, that, use, that is 
very well, it works very well with the material we utilize in this project. For the, the EPS foam can deal with great com uh, compression forces and as as you know but can tolerate very little tensile forces so this kind of vaulting the, the rhino vault software is a solver for uh, compression only structures which we started to realize in these big um, EPS trades it also sparks sparks this kind of idea of what is professionalism in, in, in building, you know, is that w the, 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 the foam being so weightless, it becomes so easy for amateurs to, to start constructing. So, you know, contrast that to, to, the, to the weight of a, of a cubic meter of, of concrete is 2,500 kilos, you know. It's 40 kilos for, uh, for EPS. And that it's a project that we designed and manufactured and, and finished uh, start to end in about, I don't know, it was three or four weeks. So that also triggers the idea is that at the, at the scale of the house, perhaps it's feasible that we can think of architects, architecture as a, as a product. These are some diagrams of the, of the design strategy, slicing up a block, pre-cutting them from, from one face and then cutting them, contour cutting them on, a, on another robot. The thing though is that what I was less satisfied with this within this project is, is the quality of materialization. So while the, the method of using uh, glass fiber and a kind of uh, acrylic with a gypsum to to render these to to render these uh, f foam discrete foam blocks is incredibly cost effective and effective in uh, in terms of manufacturing. I found it it lacking in a um, in a material sense. Right? There's this ambivalence whether you're whether you're looking as at the vault as design intended, or whether you're looking at a at a mock-up, um, a model of the archi architecture you, you intend to create, and essentially that ambivalence, I guess, comes from from its materialization right, in such a in such a lightweight material. And so I started to explore this diamond wire cutting technique to explore the possibility of being able to, to create this kind of architecture in, uh, in stone. So it would be a bit pompous to directly start in, uh, in marble, in natural stone. So this is an in, in initial uh, prototype in, uh, in artificial limestone. But uh, then I invited myself to some, some quarries in, uh, in Carrara and we found uh, a, a partner, uh, MGI, Marmel and uh, Granit d'Italia, um, who were willing to, to work with us in the continued exploration of this technique. So diamonds wires are, are utilized in, uh, in quarries to, to cut down these vast blocks into more manageable sizes. So uh, let's say more of a tool of destruction than, uh, than of creation, so to say. But that's what I found. I found this, this material with this amazing in intrinsic quality. And there's some s something essential to, uh, as an uh, as an architect coming to terms with being able to work in stone. It's something so fundamental yeah, is that it feels very empo empowering being able to, to do that, to do that kind of work. And then, yeah. We 
found something that, that was lacking in this kind of, in using these two and a half ton heavy machines to, to cut down through these very light uh, blocks of, of foam. You know, I wanted to, to do something a little bit more, more violent. If you have the chance, you should absolutely see this, this, this amazing landscape, this kind of quasi voxelized landscape in Carrara. It's, it's breathtakingly, breathtakingly beautiful. So I think this, this development of this robotic diamond wire saw, sawing takes place at, at the intersection of revisiting a, a long lost ancient craft while employing state of the art industry tools and, and bespoke software development. So this diamond wire saw was po powered by a, a hydraulic motor of 40, 40 kilowatts. So that's about as powerful as the, uh, the motor in your uh, in your car. This is not in, re in real time. I would be in the beach, living at the beach in Italy. But uh, we did that in about 40 minutes, if I if I remember correctly, and maybe that strikes you as slow. In Italy, they thought, thought it was breathtakingly fast, so that is good news. And this this research, this development, it I think from the ID till this version in total, it took about six six weeks of of development work. So that's the interesting thing about industrial robots, right? Is that you share a platform with industry, and you go can go from there's this gradual path from taking an initial ID and developing that to um, to a state where industry actually becomes becomes interested in it. So here on the right, you see this this hy hydraulic pump pumping up uh, oil in, in, uh, in considerable pressure to this motor on the, on the large flywheel on the top of the robot. So then just the pressure of the, uh, of the oil sets the, the flywheel in, uh, in motion. Most of the work was really in sort of uh, syncing up the, um, the speed of the robot of it would, the robot had to move so slow um, that actually the control software broke down um, it, in the sense that it was moving 10 times faster than the controller reported it to do. So I discretized every step into a millimeter, a millimeter to I don't know, 10 seconds or something to cut through a millimeter. But a robot can't move any slower than that, unfortunately, because the whole point of a robot is that it can move a big load, you know, 100 kilos with 5 mi meters a second or something. It's not. You have to hack this kind of software in, in order to, you know, to quiet it down. That was actually one of the, the more technical challenges. The, the interesting thing, though, is that the surface quality was just perfect, you know, ready for, for hand polishing. And I think for architectural applications, it's just done, ready, finished. And um, the in what I what I found what I found so intriguing in, in doing this kind of work was that there there's this duality of this vast amount of force, this absolute violence of the of the cutting procedure itself. And the delicateness, and the and the sensitivity, and the beauty, and the the almost the softness of the of the resulting elements, and that that strikes me that duality strikes me as something very architectural. Um, a project that I'm currently working with with my my partner in uh, Odico Formworks, Aspian Sundergaard, is that we're applying this our our method. 
method of casting, um, we use the, the wire cutting to create molds to cast arch uh, concrete architectural elements in. This is an earlier uh, design project by, uh, by Asbjorn, where he, where he uh, combined topological optimization to reduce the volume necessary to support a structure. Thing though is that this work was done with. Uh, for this work, the the molds were were robotically milled, which also is a is a considerable expense because the process is just not very scalable. So, in order to 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 move a bit faster, uh, a very large milling bit was uh, was selected, and that you know that also gave some problems apparently when. Uh, when demolding the uh, the concrete, but it, I thought it was an uh, amazing project, and I, I met Aspen in uh, at Fabricate 2011, and then we suggested to uh, the idea came up that we combine forces, right? That that we started and we started to develop a, a novel project where the design was really optimized for for wire cutting, so we d we designed this structure of about 25 30 meters um, to combine the merits of, of topology optimization where you can reduce up to 60 70 percent of the of the concrete required but in order to do so you need to you need to create these sophisticated molds that, that's something we're, we're very capable of with this this wire cutting so we thought it'd be a good idea to to see if we can combine the merits of these of these different approaches, and from that that research project, um, we we did a workshop in uh, in 2000 September 2000 no, in September 2011, and asked somebody from ABB, can we uh, lend a robot? For we want to do some wire cutting, and then. Um, this person said, yeah, of course you, you can do it, because I absolutely don't believe that you, in a week, that you can do anything with a robot. So if you can't use it, you can't use it in a week. I don't believe it. So if you can't use it, you can break it. Here you have a robot, right? It was kind of interesting logic. Um, and that that person actually is gave up his job as a sales engineer in, uh, in ABB and started a, a company in, uh, in robotic form wor work with us. Uh, now that's the, the CEO of um, Odico Formworks, uh, Anders Bundesgaard. So these are some initial casting tests of the, uh, of the molds. And Aspion has, has made an, uh, yeah, an amazing effort to, to create these molds because they're, they're really at the uh, they're they're very challenging to uh, to produce because it's it's kind of uncharted territory, right? With wire cutting, it's there's not precisely known where um, which elements are easy to produce, which are challenging to produce, and we set a we set a pretty high standard, I think. Um, so the, the the interesting thing is that the molds are are the the, the molds are so smooth that. There's also a strong tactile quality to the to the concrete that comes out of it. It's just so incredibly incredibly smooth. Um, so this is one of the first prototypes, and we expect the project to be fully realized by the uh, by the by the end of the summer. Um, a project that I realized about a year ago sort of goes back to this question of breaking up an architectural structure into discrete components. So behind me you see uh, one of the troms by, by Philibert Delorme, and he applied, he was one of the first architects to apply projective geometry to, you know, to create this volume from, from flat planar, planar drawings. And essentially, that is a that is a very architectural problem that also deals with this question of ruled surface, right? So if you have this surface and you just simply offset offset the borders of the surface, 
you know, it creates all kinds of cusps. It creates singularities. It creates a structure that, that you absolutely, yeah, that would be very, very challenging to, to realize. So I started to, to develop a segmentation algorithm that starts from the medial axis. So the, the yellow contour that you see is sort of the, uh, the axis of the surface. So you can consider a point the axis of a sphere, right? You can consider a line the axis of a, of a cylinder. But fi figuring out what is the axis of such a, such a relatively arbitrary surface is, is a challenge, right? So what you see happening now is that from that yellow contour, these contours start to propagate to the border of the surface. With a with a with a a fixed width, maximal width, if you will. So that sort of creates the the e the, um, the most continuous and easiest to manufacture uh, contours to to approximate such a such a surface. Um, then being medial curves, being in the in the center of the surface, it also has some structural properties, right? So. I've taken that, that research and experimented with uh, a project I presented at the Artefact Festival in, in uh, Leuven in Belgium last year, where these aspects of geometric realization but also fabrication really, uh, really merged. And that's, I guess that work kind of takes place in this tradition of, of stereotomy. So here you see the vault um, at the uh, Hotel de Ville in Arles, which was built by, um, by Philibert de Lorme. So I, I feel a strong linkage to that, to that tradition in, in, in architecture. And in 2012, with Aspion uh, Sundergaard and um, Anders Bundegaard, I started a, a startup called Odico, Odico Former Robotics to, to really explore this kind of idea of, you know, I'm really interested in exploring the idea of being an architect with a, with a factory. Um, so this is a shot of our factory in uh, Odense in Denmark, where we have about uh, 12 of these industrial robots employed. You know, at the far end you see our, our wire cutting robot, which is mounted on this on this 24 meter track, right? So, you know, in the morning we can cut through hundreds of, uh, of cubics of, of, of uh, meters of, of foam. Very here you see that, right? It's just enormous. And of course you can produce on, on either side of the, of the track. So we we cut th through these kind of volumes like like there's no uh, no tomorrow. So it's really on an uh, on an industrial scale. Uh, this is a, a a new idea that I'm that I'm currently uh, working on. Is that the thing with with wire cutting though is that you can only approximate ruled ruled shapes, right? And we've been tendering for a huge uh, bridge commission that required about four, four, five thousand cubic meters of uh, formwork, all just slightly double curved, right? So imagine that you needed to produce a cut where, you know, to, to approximate the double curvature over one, one and a half meters, that maybe end up with five to 10 centimeters of curvature in the opposite direction, right? So 120, maybe 10 centimeters of curvature in the opposite directory. So what I, what I was figuring is that, hmm, you know, if we can bend a metal blade, that means that we can cut double curved uh, formwork at a at considerable sp speed. So we're mounting up these these uh, ABB robots and we're, we're spanning these kind of This is 
screenshot of our of uh, the the software that I've developed um, for the for the robotic wire cutting. So in order to to work in an industrial sense, you you need to be able to import a piece of geometry and by the push of a button generate uh, the, the the robot code that is just absolutely perfect, right? And there's this. Um, in these kind of developments, usually it's quite easy to, 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 to get to an initial version in, in a few days. But then you have to realize also that it can take years before you can do the same trick at really an industrial, uh, with an industrial quality and an, at an industrial rate. So finally we're, we're, we're getting to a, to a level where we can do that, where we really can program these robots perfectly by the push of the button, where where all the motions of the of the robot are absolutely optimized, collisions are avoided, and whatnot. So here you see the formwork being uh, cut for 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 these kind of architectural elements. So over the past few years, we've done so many uh, smaller and larger projects um, that we've really created. That we now we really have the experience to to take the technology to a, to a next level. Uh, this summer, for instance, we've, we've created a, uh, the form for, for formwork for a large project in, uh, in Nordhaven, in uh, Copenhagen, uh, where you have these kind of playful elements um, that in total were about 1,600, 1600 square meters. So that is, that is already a, you know, a moving from a novel technology to employing it uh, really at a construction site, right? At an at an industrial industrial scale, which which comes with a with a set of challenges. Um, and this week we've started uh, creating the um, the formwork for this project by uh, Oliver Eliasson, which will be built in. Uh, which is the headquarters of Kirk Capital, uh, which is the, the group owning uh, Lego. So, yeah, very uh, quite wealthy. Uh. Here you see it. Here you see it in the, in the middle of the harbor of uh, Weile. So that means kind of that in about two and a half years we moved from from an idea to a technology that is really operated at a full-blown architectural scale. And yeah, let's see how that works out. Um, so we're involved in creating about 8,000 uh, square meters of, of former. That's a lot. And um, this is the, uh, the mock-up of that project that we built uh, around May, June last, last year. So here you, ah, this is a bit of a poor picture. Here you see the, uh, the, the, the concrete walls, those are being cladded with, uh, with, with brick. Yeah, this is not always the weather in Denmark, unfortunately. Most of the time it looks more like this. Um, so another exciting project is this, is this series of sculptures um, developed by uh, David Cayola, a dear, dear friend of mine. So it's it's wonderful being able to to invite your 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 your, your friends uh, developing these these amazing sculptures and then to be to be fabricated at your at your factory. It gives me gives me a great sense of fulfillment. And what David was interested in is you know exploring the the textures that he was not interested at all in creating these kind of smooth surfaces. But he was interested in the in the mechanical process of removing the material and seeing what that's what can, how that can contribute to the to the quality of the of the sculpture. Um, so about a year and a half ago, 
I was so lucky to to get invited to to visit the um, the construction site of the of the Fondation Louis Vuitton in uh, in Paris by by Frank Gehry, and. An incredibly impressive building to to visit because it's it shows you the the absolute peak of what is what is possible in architecture at that moment. It is just absolutely impressive. But it also comes with a so I felt very ambivalent because I you know you're in this environment that is from an architectural and technological point of view, from an economical point of view, I guess, overwhelming. But take a look at this shot, for instance, is that all these panels are useless in a sense, right? They're duped off panels that structurally don't contribute to the, to the, to the building whatsoever. And, you know, you are walking, so there's this sense of ambivalence because you have, you have the feeling, am I, am I looking at a masterwork or not? Is this, how, how great is this building? But you also see very confusing things, right? So I'm like, walking there, I'm confused, I'm confused. It's a little unsettling, I, I, I guess. But, you know, here I guess this project by the Bacento Viaduct by Sergio Musmeci, perhaps is really the opposite of Prangeri's architecture. And it kind of, for me, drives home the point that in architecture, economy and aesthetics are intrinsically connected. And for me, I find this a far more inspiring and far architecturally far better project. And, and can you, yeah. Can you see the point of that, that thesis? I mean, this, this amazing bridge was created with very simple, very modest materials, right? So the architectural quality versus the, the, the economic cost of erecting such a structure was high that ratio was incredible, right? The architectural result versus the, the economic input, that, that ratio is just fantastic in, the, in, the, in this work of uh, Musmeci. And I, I, I think, so when I saw this, this project, I thought like, yeah, that is the problem when, while visiting the, um, uh, the Fondation Louis Vuitton of, uh, of Gary, is that the budget was almost so unconstrained that it becomes an architectural problem, right? And that I guess, I guess the the Bacento viaduct also underscores that um, that what we are trying to explore, seeing manufacturing as a continuity of our of our design process, is is an angle worthwhile to it to explore. And recently I, I, I signed a contract with one of the, uh, I was so ex inspired by this work that I thought like, yes, that's, that's what I need to do. I don't need to build a house or a building. If I want to explore my, my technology and my architectural ideas in the best form, I need to do a bridge. Because it also reduces the, the complexity of the, of the task, right? I have this technology for doing this amazing formwork and yeah, so that's 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 what I hope to um, to be challenging the, the 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 coming year is that now for for a number of years I I developed this technology to an industrial scale. The next phase is to to see how as an architect you can um, you can combine it with your design strategy and. I think working in that way makes you competitive again. And let's see, maybe it pans out. <laughs> All right. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, but if it were 
works out, then something has been bridged, right? This rift between, this artificial rift between uh, building contractors and architects, right? If that collaboration closes, then that, then also a more symbolical bridge has, has been created, I guess. Uh, first of all, I, um, I just want to co comment on that, taking it from where you left it a bit and taking it a bit from my introduction as well, that I think that the most interesting, apart from your amazing uh, work, the most interesting related with the field of architecture is the fact that we are at the moment that we see new, um, almost disciplines appear. No, I, I have been discussing this so many times with Fabian Sawyer as well, that he's one of the of the persons very similar to you standing in between the architect and the designer, but uh, the constructors and, and the clients. And I think that this in-between space uh, with people that experiment on, on the manufacturing techniques, but they are very much related with the design and at the same time developing software and hardware is a kind of a new expertise that um, emerges and we really need to take it into consideration. And this is also like a kind of a, of, a, of a food for thinking for our students as well, no? The, the architect nowadays is not um, enough just to design, but we really need to be able to, to create our softwares and design our own tools, therefore the hardware that we need in order to realize our designs and well, optimize as well the manufacturing timings, costs, what a, what Structures. A, maybe there's a there's a second wave of uh, of these in between practitioners, such as uh, Robofold, for instance. Is that you know this this work this project they work together on with uh, I think Philip Bloch's research group was involved in the uh, in the engineering of it. Uh, did the uh, did the design of this contribution to the Venice Biennale, but you know. RoboFold intrinsically was there in the design as well, if you ask me. Because Zahadid, in a sense, bought into this aesthetic, right? And further developed it. But the authorship of that is very diffuse, I, I would say. It would be, I think it's really dumb to, to say that they're just a facilitating a company, facilitating this, this kind of project. No. They, they sparked it as well, right? So I, I think it's getting even more complex. <laughs> I, I, I definitely ho hope so, yeah, yeah. I guess the, the first project that, uh, that introduced this was the, was the Gantenbein uh, of, of uh, Fabio uh, Gramazio and Matthias, Matthias Kohler, right, is that, that I guess that opened the, the floodgates to to start to to explore this, right? So it's yeah, it's we're not passively facilitating uh, the wishes of others, right? It's I think that's the that's the the next level level to to, to reach, yeah. But in order to do that, you need to be in an economy, right? And economy and architecture. I mean, when the crisis hit in 2008, I think. 50% of the, the volume, the building volume was reduced in the Netherlands. 50% of the volume, building volume was cut. I mean, that basically means not necessarily 50% of the architects were laid off, but sure as hell they didn't have anything to do, right? So that is dramatic. And if you're, huh? Yeah, but that, that means that you need to fundamentally revisit what is the profession. And, you know, in uh, perhaps a pompous way of seeing this is that maybe we are recovering lost ground. Maybe that's what's, what's going on. Maybe that's a, that's a good, good way of phrasing uh, these kind of wild ambitions that we have. Any questions for Tele? No questions, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, have you thought about 
the issue of waste because um, at least if you use foam as formwork, then I'm assuming that you can't reuse the pieces after you uh, set the concrete. Sorry, your question was? Like, have you thought about the issue of waste with the formwork? Uh, we don't have waste. You don't. But what, like, what happens to the foam? So th there's there's so many ways that you can uh, what you can do with the uh, with the waste is that first of all it doesn't exist because the the the, the left of m of materials you know when the supplier brings in fresh stock material they take away additional offcuts and those are those are grind to pieces and new new foam blocks are constructed from that right so. This is one big factor, I would say. When you think of when you think of uh, concrete, is that concrete is a, has become a composite material for most uh, most building projects in the sense that if you go to a prefab factory, uh, the what you see is that the three materials most prevalently used are, are insulation material, foam, steel, and concrete, right? So it's an, it's an integ integ integral part of, of working with, uh, with concrete. So in a sense, we, we don't really have leftovers. And um, there's also been considerable experimentation in, for instance, grinding down grinding down the, the foam to as an additive for for concrete such to in, increase the uh, insulation value of the of the concrete so there's you know I think perhaps one of the, of the most fundamental laws in in architecture is that steel and and concrete they go incredibly well together right I mean they 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 have the same Expansion coefficients, and that's that's basically is the the natural law of of how our current environment is looking on, right? That's the the under underlier underlying fundamental law. But perhaps it's the it's the, the this marriage of steel, concrete, and foam is is the next level. Could be could be very possible. It, it works so incredibly well, these materials, that the question of, uh, of offcuts is, is, not, is not such an issue. No. And don't forget, in a sense, that foam, first and foremost, is air, trapped air. Yeah. I mean, think of a crazy business model, right? Is that you buy blocks of foam, you don't anything, right, which is basically air, right? Then from this air, you cut the material away, and you sell it for more. <laughs> you already have it's fun, huh? Yeah. Added value, no way. <laughs> Any other questions? I can keep on going, eh? Because I have quite a lot of questions. But uh, in the in the marble project, which I think that it is an astonishing astonishing project, that it could go to a scale that is quite terrifying, actually. But um, I have two questions. First one is, how did you create the tool? Uh, is it an existing tool that you just created the base so that you can attach it to a robotic arm, or how did you manage to create all this kind of of hardware there? And the second one, uh, it has to do to whether uh, the most complicated thing was the tool itself, so the hardware, or whether the software that um, you had to develop to the GCO for cutting the marble. Right. So, you know, diamond wires are are usually used when you have to cut something and all the other options didn't work, right? It's kind of, if you need to break something apart, uh, resolving to diamond wires is kind of your last, last, last option. Uh, so most of the time they're used in this fashion, right? You have this big, big block of amorphous marble that slices it up into, uh, into more manage manageable pieces. 
So it's not a, a technique to give form to something, right? It's just slab, slabbing it to, uh, to more manage manageable sizes. So creating the, um, the end effector was in a sense, well, I'm more of a software than a, than a hard, hardware guy, but I, I, I built that, uh, this, this end effector. And yeah, yeah, but it was not super difficult, I would say. So most of the aluminum frames is that these are recycled end effectors from the automotive industry. So you have these aluminum coupling elements and beams that just exist. So it's a kind of Lego, Lego elements for adults, very easy to work with. Um, the pulleys are from Husqvarna, and the the kind of the real deal, the expensive machine is basically that is an incredibly powerful uh, pump uh, that runs on 32 ampere. It's like serious stuff, and. That's the that's just an off the off the shelf machines. Some of these pulleys are also also off the shelf. So just combining that uh, is not super difficult. It's uh, but the process is very violent. Yeah? Is that I mean this 2.2 ton robot was really like shaking if it had Parkinson. But uh, strangely enough, these these cuts were just so perfect. So super super smooth and, uh, yeah it's fun to do that yeah <laughs> um, it's more a practical question um, how did you start like like uh, most of the, the uh, of like the where do you get the funds to start? Uh, like maybe, uh, yeah, you find this this um, uh, industry in Antwerp that was closing, for example, and then you could buy maybe mm -hmm. a good stock of. But these machines, like like especially the uh, the arm, the robotic arm, um, right. cost like really like big money. Usually, and then I mean, um, like for example, what is the cost of of, of an arm, and then. Okay, so all the structure you, you build all the structure for doing the um, the wire cutting, but then the yeah. So in, in Rotterdam, I have four of these uh, old ABB robots. So they're really pensionadas of uh, industry in a sense, right? These are about 20 years old and the first generation of modern ABB uh, robots. By modern, I mean the language you program them in is not some kind of assembly language it's kind of it's the same it's a subset of the instructions on modern ABB robots right so the code that works on this robot also works on a, on a modern robot uh, so that's that's pretty cool and then um, in a sense an industrial robot itself is not that expensive right it's somewhere around 40 to 60 thousand euros so it's not so expensive in terms of its projected production value. That's what I mean, not so expensive, because I don't have 40 or 60,000 euros. Not by a long shot. The thing, though, is that um, I found these robots from a uh, back supplier of Mercedes, right? So Mercedes produces a certain car model for five years then they basically ship the whole production lane to, to, a, to a back supplier and they supply sort of uh, back orders for, for the car manufacturer, right? Because they move on and start producing new, new models. Um, so I managed to acquire them for basically uh, the value in, uh, in, in, in weight in our metal in a sense, but basically their, their, their value in scrap, which is pretty cool. Yeah. But these kind of second-hand robots are not that shockingly expensive. I think on the market you can find uh, f around five, f between five, seven and a half thousand euros. Yeah. Yeah. And when you think of what you can, the income that you can generate with such a machine, it's, it's considerable in a sense. 
And in a sense, in hindsight, it's also it's something that worked out well to have uh, an old robot that has been used, and you know these were welding robots, so they look really totally messed up. Is that I don't think you're gonna do some something as dangerous as and uh, or as wild as diamond wire cutting on the you know a robot that doesn't have any scratches and uh, costs sixty thousand euros. And you see that attitude in some of the universities, like you know <laughs> right, just don't touch it. That machine is expensive. Come on, you know. And, uh, in a sense, these also these industrial robots, they're so well built, right? Is that the most modern robots, I think the mean time between failures, it's something like 800,000 uh, hours, right? So that's eight years of 24-7 production, the mean time between failures, right? If they're, if they're maintained. So it's, in a sense, a robot, you install it, you run it, forget it. Yeah, that's, the, yeah. Mechanical, the mechanical problem of building has been resolved. That's, that's in a sense my, my takeaway from, from that. Uh, Anybody else? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm wondering, have you considered using uh, a chemical process? Because uh, it seems like all of the cutting is very physical. So, so all the? The cutting. Yeah. Um, it's quite a physical process. And with the limestone, um, you know, especially you have to use a much harder material to cut the limestone, and then it takes a very long time. Yeah. Have you thought about using some kind of chemical process to um, speed up the cutting? Or I guess chemical processes and stone don't work. Uh, chemical processes and foam would be uh, very dangerous. <laughs> and sort of also do away with this idea of being able to uh, recycle the cutouts. Because, yeah, I really am fond of this idea of not really having having any waste in our in our factory. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah. So if you you know you can dissolve it by throwing some oil away, but you're basically you're burning valuable uh, stock. So and uh, I think it's also not so controllable. But uh, could be a fun idea. I guess I guess with a blowtorch or something. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. No, I think that would be pretty risky and uh, uncontrollable and, and not very economical. Yeah. Okay, so thanks for your attention, I guess. We yeah? just want to thank you and to Actually, thank you for being here, not only for the lecture, but for a workshop with some of the guys that we have here um, in the auditorium, some of the students, and together with Tape Pigram, tomorrow you start like a three-day intensive working yeah. uh, on hot wire uh, cutting with a robot, and hopefully we'll have some very nice big scale results by Monday. Yeah, look, look forward to working yeah. with you guys. Thank you Should very much. Fun. Thank you, Jelly. All right, cheers.